I'm Gail Summerfield, Director of Women and Gender in Global Perspectives Program. And with Jim Barrett, who you saw walk, here he comes back again, and who is speaking today, uh, we are co-chairing the Center for Advanced Study Immigration Initiative that technically will be in 2008, 2009, but is starting now in terms of pre-events because this is obviously a critical topic for concern right at the moment. And um, we have, the center brings together these initiatives to, it's a fairly recent program, but the idea is to get people from units across campus, faculty and students debating, discussing, exploring these topics in new ways and in more depth than they might otherwise. The year of the initiative, there will be a course that's available and there will also be additional speakers. Uh, I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of events that are coming up. The one today is called Global, Local, and Personal, Understanding the History of Immigration to the United States in the 20th Century, and it will be by Jim Barrett and with comments by Augusto Espiritu, um, both from history. And then on Thursday, February 8th, here, the another CAS initiative that's going on this year on mega disasters will have a speaker, Amy Guida from Journalism and Law, uh, talking on From Science to Time to Vanity Fair, Global Warming Becomes a Hot Topic. And um, I encourage you to hear that. And then for our, those of you who would like a little bit more on immigration, next Monday at noon, Sylvia Puente, who's been working with the Notre Dame Project in Chicago for a number of years and who is an alum from UIUC is going to be speaking um, not too far from here at the new building called Christopher Hall. And her topic will be, let me see, Perspectives on Illinois Immigrant Integration Policies. And that's on 904 West Nevada Street. And all of this is on the Center for Advanced Study website and our website. And I see some of you who are working with us already on this immigration initiative. And I do encourage others of you who have interest to connect and we try to find different ways to explore this topic together in the next few years. So for now, I would just like to introduce Jim Barrett to begin uh, his the topic. His area is comparative labor history, and uh, he's been working on campus for quite a while and has done a number of different immigration topics. There's really more than I can begin to uh, address in his vita, and I encourage you to take a look at some of the materials that he's published that are uh, given in his history website. He's uh, this is an article, is, is a paper that he delivered in Beijing by the same title that he's been working on since then. Uh, but he delivered it uh, in China and was received well. They're interested in U.S. immigration policy as well as their own migration uh, issues. Uh, and he's also been working on things recently such as remembering Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, was the personal political reading of the autobiography of American communism, um, and just a pretty uh, wide range of topics that all center in some ways around historical policy issues. Augusto Espiritu is focusing more on Asian American immigration issues, and he has done a lot on the Philippines, the Filipino American intellectual, also in history, as I said, and Asian American studies. Uh, he's going to bring in some comments from that perspective when he makes comments on the paper. Oh, and welcome, I see him here now. So now I will turn it over to Jim, and again, thank you all for making it out here in this weather. Just a couple of quick thank yous uh, to uh, Liesl and Masumi and to everybody else at the Center for Advanced Study for making this happen. Uh, to Gail, uh, my collaborator, uh, for the introduction and also for all of her work. And also to all of you for joining us today. Um, my 
father-in-law is very much uh, on my mind as I talk to you today about immigration, and so I wanted to start with him because uh, he's kind of a case in point. Uh, he died last month in Shanghai, but uh, he'll be buried uh, on the south side of Chicago, and it turns out that this juxtaposition is important to what I have to say today. Uh, in many respects, this is somebody who uh, spent seven long days a week standing in front of a uh, walk for the most part. He was a chef, uh, very hard working life, but uh, read continually in English as well as in Chinese and is very much the sort of uh, blue collar cosmopolitan or was uh, that I tell my students about. And I wanted to begin with a story that um, draws out a number of um, implications of what I have to say today. And I'm a good empirical social historian, so I should say that this story is probably apocryphal, uh, but that's okay uh, because it makes a couple of important points. It has to do with a Chinese immigrant family. Um, this is an unusual case in the sense that the family was united. Uh, the mother was here in the States as well as the uh, father, and a number of children, and they settled into uh, a neighborhood, a uh, working class neighborhood, on the near northwest side of Chicago in the early part of this century. And as immigrants do, uh, they picked up a bit of the language. Uh, the parents picked it up through their shop, a hand laundry, uh, in dealing with customers. And their kids, as is often usually the case, picked it up much more quickly uh, on the streets and in school. So you could say that they were making an adjustment to their new home. But it was only uh, quite a while later, several years later, that they realized that the language that they picked up actually was not English, it was Polish. Uh, so you have a Polish-speaking Chinese family uh, living in uh, one of the ethnic neighborhoods in Chicago. And while the stories may be, not sure about that, uh, apocryphal, the situation is actually quite possible uh, for anybody that knows much about ethnic neighborhoods. It was possible to do most of what you needed to do without recourse to English. Uh, I think that everyone today wants to talk about transnationalism and sort of leave the state behind. And I honestly can't think of an experience uh, that's more transnational than these millions of immigrants who came to the United States. And the easy part of this is to sketch out the sort of structural dimensions of it and the broad kind of social processes that we like to spend most of our time talking about. Um, but what I want to try to shift our attention to today is the human scale of immigration, the actual experience of uh, immigrant people. And these people themselves, I would argue, were transnational in a very profound sense, embracing cultures and consciousness that were that they encountered in the course of this migration. And not, we've learned not to think in strictly linear terms with regard to immigration. So I'm not simply talking about uh, the Chinese family that moves into this neighborhood in Chicago and learns Polish. Very often migrants pass through a number of different societies and their values and ideas and their consciousness, I would argue, was transnational uh, in that sense. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, uh, I should mention at the beginning that this is an unusual sort of talk. Usually what you get is a very focused academic style talk um, making a particular sort of an argument and we're in kind of a different business today. Uh, what we're trying to do is to sort, sort of think at a very broad level about migration and so if the uh, other, if my fellow empiricists out there get uh, impatient at some point, uh, this is uh, the sort of general idea and I'd be glad to focus in on parts of this if you like. The first thing that I'll do is to talk a little bit about scholars' engagement with immigration, but at a very nuts and bolts sort of level. In other words, how have we tried to understand this over the course of the 20th century? The second thing I wanted to do is to suggest three obviously related uh, levels of uh, immigration experience, or maybe as scholars of immigration, maybe we want to think about these as venues within which to observe the experience. And then finally, I want to talk about two actually very old concepts in immigration history. The first one is acculturation, not to say assimilation. 
for reasons that I'll explain as we go ahead. But um, the implicit argument here, I guess, is yes, there very much is indeed a process of acculturation. It's very important to look at. So that's one of the concepts that I'll be looking at. And the second is what sociologists, the early scholars of immigration, called the problem of the generations, or sometimes they, they actually said the problem of the second uh, generation, and really the role that the second generation plays in this process uh, of acculturation. And I think that um, history is full of ironies, and one of the ironies here is that when we look at the uh, process of immigration, I would argue at least that the human experience of immigration, uh, when we go from the global to the local, can actually best be understood almost in kind of personal terms, and that's uh, uh, one of the spots where the paper will wind up. I'm hoping that this paper will suggest some parallels between the migrant peoples that I'm going to be talking about and much more recent immigration. And my colleague, who I neglected to thank at the beginning, Augusto Espiritu, uh, who's come out from California. Um, I was thinking of starting with one of my typical jokes about the hardy immigrants being in the Midwest and the softer immigrants going out to California. And then I thought about that for a while, and I realized it was probably the smarter immigrants that went out to California. But in any case, he's come back today, uh, sort of bad timing. Um, I think that uh, Augusto is going to take up uh, the more recent uh, migration. I'll be sort of referring to it as we go along, but I didn't want to disappoint anybody. I'm going to be talking about mostly the period of the early 20th century when I refer to these experiences. And I'm going to be talking particularly about uh, the group that was called the New Immigrants. These are people mainly from Southern and Eastern Europe. But one of the points I want to make today is that it's really quite impossible and actually very misleading to talk strictly in terms of European immigration and to not think more broadly about the contacts between these European immigrants and the new migrant peoples uh, who are coming around the same time. Um, just to give you some idea of the scale, and I'll put a, a, a table up here in a minute, a graph, uh, to give you some idea of the volume of immigration. But for the period from the 1880s to the 1920s, which is roughly the period that I'm kind of focusing on today, we had an immig immigration of about 25 million people. And just about the time that that immigration began to, uh, it never really stopped, but when it began to dissipate a bit, um, you had a massive influx of African American and Mexican migrants. And uh, if I don't make any other point today, uh, what I want to draw people's attention to is the fact that there was indeed contact between these people, and it's very important to pay attention to because it can tell us a lot about how acculturation took place. So think not ethnic, think interethnic. Um, in terms of the stages of immig immigration historiography, the great sort of patriarchs uh, in this field uh, include the Chicago sociologists, uh, who wrote in the early 20th century, in the 1920s and 30s especially, and they're writing in the wake of this great migration of the European peoples, but also of African Americans and the uh, uh, Spanish-speaking migrants, to places like Chicago, south side of Chicago, where they were working, and so they're very much caught up in this. But the other figure is a guy by the name of Oscar Hanlon, who some people will recognize and others won't. Um, he's uh, Harvard, uh, spent most of his career at Harvard, and um, he is very much influenced by these Chicago sociologists, much more, I think, than people have realized. And he emphasizes a lot of the same themes. What are the themes? Uh, alienation, um, conflict between generations, uh, and, and then accommodation and assimilation. Uh, this is the sort of argument that the um, Chicago sociologists would make in Hanlon uh, actually titled his great book, probably his most influential book, uh, one that uh, was a Book of the Month Club selection and remained on the New York Times bestseller list for quite a while. I'm addressing these remarks especially to the few historians here in the audience. Uh, you might have a book that do that, that does that, but actually it's pretty unlikely. Uh, so, so this is an important book. That's my point. And the title is significant. It sort of tells you a lot about Hanlon's approach and the ideas that he took from the Chicago sociologist. His book is titled The Uprooted, Ripped Up by the Roots, 
uh, a lot of enemy, a lot of uh, alienation, uh, uh, disorientation. Uh, they're actually quite interested in social pathology, and they think that migration actually contributes to a sort of degeneration, in a way, of these older communities, uh, and even, to some extent, the individual. And my argument is that you can see these arguments about disorganization and accommodation in uh, some of the early uh, immigration history as well. It's telling, I think, I uh, don't have too much time to go into it right now, but I'd be very glad to talk about it, it's something I'm very interested in, that it's telling that the Chicago sociologists called their theory a race relations cycle. They call the uh, generation of immigrants that are coming in from Europe races, and they're thinking in sort of racial terms. Now, that's not comparable to the way we would use the term today. That's not my argument. But my point is that these categories are actually quite fuzzy, and that's something which I can talk about uh, if people uh, would like me to. In terms of generations of scholarship, this interpretation was ripe for revision by the 1960s. And in the next two decades, that is from the 60s through, through most of the 80s, inspired by contemporary social science methods and a new bottom-up approach, emphasizing the immigrants' own agency, a new generation of historians began to reinterpret immigration history, dismantling the old narrative of disorganization and assimilation as part of a broader revision of post-war consensus history. No more consensus history, conflict uh, and change. Until recently, most of the research on European immigration has analyzed the creation of distinct ethnic enclaves in American cities. And it's also focused on the persistence of old world cultures in the new urban industrial environment. Themes of continuity, cultural persistence, community formation also emerge not only in the study of European immigrants, but also, I would argue, and this is something we can talk about, also in the studies of black and Mexican migration and the formation of the barrio and the ghetto. In clearing some space for African American and Latino Latino Americans in the thick white foliage of US history, earlier scholars in each of those fields also stressed the formation of distinct segregated communities, each with its own separate ethnic institutions and movements. These early scholars, I'm not referring to uh, some of the contemporary scholars who are sitting here with us today, but these earlier scholars of African American and Latino history tended, I would argue, to minimize class distinctions and conflict within ghetto and barrio communities, emphasizing instead the impact of racism. Until recently, there was also relatively little discussion of inter-ethnic contacts. That's no longer true. Things are changing, as I'll try to suggest. While Asian American history is a much newer field, it has followed something like the same historiographical trajectory. In more recent years, there are concepts that people have used that have led us to a more inter-ethnic sort of approach. And I should mention early on in the talk, uh, I think Gail referred to it, that I'm a labor historian and I'm very concerned with issues of social class and with class conflict. And I would argue it's not the only concept that did this, but the concept, for example, of proletarianization working class formation is one that helped to sort of draw people's attention to inter-ethnic sort of, uh, an inter-ethnic kind of approach. These, no, these new social historians of immigration and migration were reacting to earlier breakdown models of migration that stressed this alienation produced by moves from urban to rural environments, from rural to urban environments, and from one society to another. And they were emphasizing continuity and persistence agency, and group ethnic identities of these workers and their families. The focus is now shifting to this issue of interaction between groups and diverse peoples who often, after all, worked and lived more than, uh, the, there is empirical research on this, which I'd also be glad to talk about, lived much more amongst one another than we have been led to believe. Um, the critical element in this inter-ethnic inter approach is its relational argument. In other words, that you can't really understand ethnic groups in isolation. This is particularly true for whiteness studies and critical race studies. The argument is that you can't really understand, in that case, the formation, for example, of white identity without thinking about uh, it relationally with various others labeled non-white. 
in the society. Now at the broadest level, um, the story of immigration is of course a global story. And that's where many people would like to place the emphasis uh, now. And so far as that goes, I think that's fine. I would agree with that. In fact, I would just draw people's attention to the fact that it's not simply global in terms of the movement of peoples or something else that I'm interested in, the, the uh, transnational market for uh, investment capital and for commodities. It's also transnational in the sense of ideas and values and experiences. So there's a trade, if you will, going on there as well. And it's global in all these sort of senses. The massive influx of people into the United States from around the globe since the 1965 Immigration Act has undoubtedly lent greater agency to Frank Thistlewhite's very old argument that migration to the United States can only be understood as part of a global process. Most studies of the past three decades have included an obligatory chapter on the old world, but the full implications of Thistlewhite's observation have become apparent only recently. Even for the diverse range of Europeans involved, acknowledging the global character of immigration stresses international networks that were not only economic, but also cultural and ideological in nature. To take an example that remarkably is not mentioned these days very much uh, in the whole discussion of transnationalism, the Socialist International had a vision of a global working class. And in fact, that vision was embodied in, in, to a considerable degree by the turn of the century in the ranks of Italian, East European, and other immigrant workers uh, traveling not just to the United States, but to many other developing societies throughout the world. These global migrants moved throughout the developing capitalist world, bringing with them not only their energy and strength, which is what economists always stress, but also ideas, experience, and strategies. The most important effect of conceptualizing migration globally is the recognition, simple in a way, but forgotten until pretty recently, that this is not a European story, but one that involved indentured and other forms of labor, not just wage labor, as well as people moving from various parts of the world to places like the United States. The truly compelling element in this story, for me at least, is the mixture of these people. In the big city, uh, which is where I spend most of my time working, uh, but also in more remote industrial settings uh, for the purposes of today throughout North America. At the same time, I'd argue that it's really not possible to document the political implications of this process without considering the nation. For good or ill, the national government bestowed or withheld voting rights, civil liberties, and other basic citizenship rights. During the World War I era and later, the national government here in the United States also practiced what might be termed coercive acculturation or to use the term that I'm going to be using today, Americanization. In one of the most extreme cases, US immigration legislation systematically marginalized and racialized Chinese immigrants. And by largely proscribing women's immigration, created a distinct bachelor culture in American Chinatowns. Uh, I'll only go into this if people want to talk about it, but one of the ironies in doing this is that it enhanced contact across racial and ethnic lines. So it's clear now that we're doing more research on it that there's a lot of relationships between Chinese men, for example, and Polish immigrants and African-American women. I'm thinking about both Chicago and New York here, but presumably it's happening elsewhere. It is essential to begin thinking beyond the boundaries of the nation state, but the national context remains important to explaining everyday situations facing these immigrant people. For those historians primarily interested in the mentalities and agency of immigrant workers, the local context also remains vital. And of course, local does not have to mean urban or strictly national. 
Some of the most interesting work recently has focused on smaller industrial communities, while colonial venues raise a whole range of new issues about the roles of immigrants under imperialism. Ideologies of imperialism, for example, help to explain the increasingly racialized discourse of the late 19th and early 20th century. It was a worldview that required a categorization not only of Cubans, Filipinos, Chinese, and other colonial peoples, but also of the waves of immigrants arriving from Eastern Europe, Italy, and elsewhere in these years. And you can see this inscribed in the laws of the United States, a racial perspective on these European immigrants coming in. In turn, the European immigrants defined their own identities in relation to this discourse and these categories, and that's the story of whiteness, the development of a white sort of identity on the part of these people. Yet the local focus of the new social historians and their empirical research habits remain essential to grasping the significance of this global diversity as it was experienced by workers on a daily basis. So now we're coming from the national to the local. The international, national, and local dimensions of immigrant workers' consciousness, for example, are conveyed by David Montgomery's observation that participants in strikes and demonstrations in the early 20th century could often be seen arranged by ethnic group marching behind the American flag and singing the internationale. The ethnic, national, and international identities displayed in such a spectacle begin to suggest the complexity of immigrant workers' mentalities. I want to draw your attention now to the most intimate sort of level of this analysis, which is the personal. And it's the part that is, I would argue is almost never talked about. And maybe with good reason, it's a difficult part of the story to work on. There is a hidden history of immigration that needs to be studied in order to understand the immigrants themselves, Robert Orsi wrote in 1985. Immigration was as much a spiritual event as it was a political and social response to particular historical conditions. The outward journeying was matched by a changing inner terrain. He's talking about the subjective people's sort of consciousness of themselves and so forth. The task of reconstructing the personal lives of historically inarticulate immigrant workers appears particularly daunting. But there are our sources to do this. And ironically, some of these are old sources. The personal narrative, for example, and the oral history interview. The personal narrative or life history was present at the birth of immigration scholarship in the Chicago Sociologist Studies of Immigrant Life. And archival collections in Chicago and also the survey of race relations papers at Stanford contain numerous personal histories assembled by these scholars and by their students. And their students are very often not WASP. They're from these immigrant communities. And the sociologists send them out into their communities to do interviews and to construct or to gather these personal uh, narratives. For the Chicago sociologists, the narratives tended to focus on personal or group pathology. But they can also be read not simply as sources, and what I mean by that is for the details that they provide regarding particular aspects of immigrant life, but also as cultural historians would read them today as texts for what they suggest about how immigrant workers viewed themselves, the world about them, their places in it. Memoirs might also allow us to better understand how immigrants experienced the social processes we have been sketching at the global and local levels, how they felt about these experiences. And maybe also something of their personal identities as they related to the social identities with which we have been primarily concerned. There are some dangers in doing this, uh, and probably they've occurred to people already, but I think that there's a sense in which some other peoples and some other cultures, maybe some of these peoples that we have under the microscope now, these new immigrant peoples, were what Donna Gabacha says, describes as less psychological and less concerned with the self. Uh, 
than early 21st century upper middle class Midwestern intellectuals might be. One place to locate Orsi's inner terrain, which has um, uh, been probed in ways by immigration historians, but not so much by labor historians, is religion. If ideology, what we call ideology, if that can be defined for the moment as one's understanding of the world and how it works, in other words, not formal political ideology, but ways that people think about their world. If it can be defined that way, religion, I think, is very significant in grasping motivation. And it's truly remarkable in that sense that social scientists spend as little time as they do thinking about religion, especially since not all, but many of these new immigrant people were deeply religious people. Uh, to some extent, for them at least, religion would be at the center of their lives. And yet the church, or the synagogue, or the mosque, and the reasons people went to these places are part of the same story, I would argue, as the union and the strike, for example. And the reasons people organized and launched strikes. This is not two different stories. These are the same people we're talking about, and it's very important, to, I think, to at least be thinking about the connections here. Studying the spiritual dimension of immigrant workers' lives would help us to understand what people believed was right and wrong, what they wanted and what they wanted to avoid, what they hoped the world would be like if they and others around them would only behave themselves. And when we think about those kinds of questions, isn't that, to some extent, what we mean by the term consciousness? Changes in the way we look at immigration history recently have brought us back rather forcefully to this older theme of acculturation. Some immigration historians and sociologists even seem prepared to resurrect the old melting pot image in an effort to grasp the process by which European immigrants, for the moment, became American workers. But, sorry. I have a good excuse today. This is uh, turmoil in the family between China and Chicago and the West Coast and East Coast. Um, changes, so changes in the way that we look at immigration have brought us back to this old question of acculturation. Some immigrant historians and sociologists uh, even seem prepared to resurrect this old idea of the melting pot. pot. But um, it, it's a, we, we, we've abandoned straight line sort of notions of, a, of assimilation for good reason. The whole process is much more complicated than that. But I think that that doesn't mean we should not look at the process by which immigrants came to terms with these societies. The most recent work stresses the gradual integration of immigrant workers into broader social and political movements, for example, and their own agency in creating a new multi-ethnic society and culture in the United States in the early 20th century. What this has led to is kind of many Americanisms, if you will. You know, you can think about this process of acculturation as one in which new immigrant people are kind of brought to heel and absorbed into a sort of mainstream American culture. There's no mainstream American culture. These pe at least not where these people were sort of living their lives. There's sort of many notions of Americanism. That's the point in a way. It's a highly contested sort of uh, notion. Uh, as Gary Gersel, uh, historian, notes, the new work on Americanization, much of it written by social historians, emphasizes the immigrants' own roles in creating these many Americanisms. And thus, Gersel concludes, Americanization has lost the linearity it possessed in earlier accounts, and it's become a chaotic, pluralistic site of postmodern invention. Yet another one, alas. Uh, turns out there's no easy answers in history. The big change among social historians, however, has been the, this turn towards the interethnic, the process of acculturation and the creation of a society, a more hybrid kind of society. Studies of racial identity have examined the process by which many European immigrants entered American society in marginal racial categories uh, and then gradually achieved, if you want to think about it in those terms, uh, an ascribed status as whites. Historians are just beginning to analyze immigrants' own values about race. These undoubtedly drew on old world prejudices, 
and notions of difference. In other words, all the ideas about social difference don't come from American society. Think about anti-Semitism, for example, uh, which is uh, imported and alive and well in these immigrant communities. Um, or other forms of intolerance, uh, northern Italians versus swarthy southern Italians and so on. So they don't all come from the American society, but they were increasingly influenced, I think, by mainstream US racial ideology and practice, if for no other reason than the government's following that and its policies, and this is what you're going to hear in the United States often at the time. The most important influence of the so-called whiteness studies, I would argue, for immigration history has been the investigation of the roots of racist values, language, and repertoires of behavior, uh, for want of a better phrase, the reproduction of white racism among immigrant people who became white. And the implications of that for African American, Latino, Latino, and Asian migrants who were permanently excluded from the broader category. An earlier generation of scholarship on Americanization stressed various elite efforts to acculturate immigrants, employer, government, and settlement house programs, with the more recent work tending to stress the coercive dimensions of these efforts. Just for purposes of focus here. But the statistics, if you bother to look at them, are low. In other words, how many people are affected by these sort of programs, you're, you're really not talking about a lot of people. And it appears on the basis of that that this is not simply the way that people came to terms with the new society. The contention here um, instead, and it's one that requires a good deal more research, is that much of the gradual acculturation of immigrant workers likely occurred more through informal contexts at the workplace, in the community, than any sort of formal top-down process. Labor historians, of course, have tended to focus on social movements, uh, unions, political organizations, and so forth, which were often inter-ethnic in their composition and perspective, and seem to have played a role in what I'm calling Americanization, either through these informal contacts or sometimes through formal labor education programs for immigrants. There were several elements to labor's version of Americanism, and not surprisingly, activists frequently emphasized basic civil liberties, particularly free speech, and encouraged immigrants to speak up and to defend their rights. So, for example, if you want to envision the kind of setting that I'm talking about where this Americanization might be taking place, in coal companies, steel mills, and in many other open shop industrial communities, Organizing often began, labor organizing often began with a struggle for free speech, with immigrants learning the values of these freedoms in the midst of organizing activities, strikes, and demonstrations. In the Menang Hill Valley area around Pittsburgh, in the organizing that took place in the First World War and during the 1919 steel strike, there was no free speech. People were not allowed. To, to meet publicly and to discuss these sort of issues. The union had to fight for that, and I can't think of a better way of teaching people the importance of free speech than in that sort of context. Organizers might also struggle to instill, not always, but in some cases, to instill a measure of ethnic tolerance, what we might call today multiculturalism. And they did this, did this if only because successful organizing demanded such tolerance in the context of great ethnic diversity. In the case of the stockyards in Chicago, 45 different nationalities. And if you're not prepared to organize across those ethnic lines, you have no organization at all. There's no way to have an effective sort of labor organization. For many immigrant workers then, introduction to the American political and economic system came not through night school classes, but through translated discussion and debate at union meetings, informal conversations with fellow workers, and labor movement publications printed in various languages. And the union's version of Americanism was likely to be quite different from the one conveyed, for example, in employers' uh, programs. I'd like to be clear that my argument actually is not the old argument that social class was more or, I would hasten to add, less important than ethnicity in immigrants' identity. 
Rather, what I'm suggesting is that working class settings and experiences can help us to understand how immigrant workers came to terms with their new environments, and in turn, how ethnic diversity shaped the process of social class formation in the United States. There are dangers uh, in interpreting this experience in strictly sort of class terms, and I would be glad to talk about that. I mean, for the moment, I just acknowledge that. But I would also like to observe that in today's academic climate, it's far more likely that we would forget the very real class dimensions of immigrants' lives than their ethnic and racial identities. An intriguing feature of this process was the interaction between labor activists, often speaking similar but different languages and steeped in similar ideological traditions. Uh, and this sort of a hybrid uh, um, kind of ethnic working class culture. And I won't go into much detail, but just to sort of uh, click a um, couple times in people's minds, German-speaking Marxists are an example of this. They organized among Germans and published for, for German immigrants, but they also published for other German-speaking immigrants and often crossed the lines to Poles and so forth. Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian labor and socialist activists built what they actually called Scandinavian labor movements. Those are actually different languages, but they're sort of close enough and people are physically close enough to try to do this. Uh, a combination of native discrimination and proletarianization produced even closer inter-ethnic identifications and relations among these new immigrants that I'm calling our attention to. They shared not only common industrial grievances, but also the middle class and many native, native workers scorn for hunkies, the term that was applied to many of the, especially the Slavic immigrants. What's interesting here is that by the post-war era, post-World War I, uh, this is my period, Slavic steel workers in the Pittsburgh region and beyond embraced the label with pride, as in, we are all mill hunkies. Rudolf Vicoli noted a similar process among Finnish, Croatian, and other iron ore miners in northern Minnesota who came to be called and also called themselves iron rangers. While the immigrants were extremely diverse and recognized distinctions among themselves, the fact that they were so often lumped together began to shape their own consciousness. Gabacha and Fraser Atinelli delineate what they term a Latin melting pot phenomena in which Italian immigrants and Spanish-speaking workers created a hybrid, radical working class subculture in a variety of settings around North and South America. Perhaps the most striking U.S. case of this kind of inter-ethnic radical culture developed in Tampa's Ybor City, where Cubans, Spaniards, and recent Sicilian immigrants created a rich culture of opposition a radical industrial union, and a number of important cultural and economic institutions embracing men and women workers, despite the strength of machismo in the local Latin culture. Such inter-ethnic cultures thrived in cities throughout North and South America. The anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist labor movements of these regions were based in large part on the interaction of immigrants from Italian, Spanish, and other immigrant backgrounds. This process may have advanced actually further in smaller industrial locations than it did in large cities. In a large city with a large immigrant population of whatever nationality you want to pick out, you can sustain uh, ethnic organizations and sort of a, a expansive ethnic culture. It's much more difficult to do that in a small mining town. And so when you have a small mining town, as we did throughout sections of the coal fields in Illinois, with vast sort of uh, ethnic diversity, uh, those people are actually likely to be interacting rather closely. And it's pretty hard, actually, for them to uh, put up these kinds of uh, uh, ethnic uh, barriers. And finally, in terms of concepts, I want to draw your attention to this issue of generations. The generational dimension of immigrant acculturation represents another older theme in the immigration historiography. Sociological literature of the early 20th century often noted the tension between immigrants and their native-born children, what I was calling earlier the problem of the second generation. As in other areas of their work, the Chicago sociologists stressed a complex evolutionary process of assimilation in which the second generation occupied a central and also a very stressful position. Their problem, 
as the historian Marcus Lee Hansen, uh, who did all of his work at the University of Illinois, incidentally Znanetsky, who's a famous Chicago sociologist, was also in our sociology department. As Hansen wrote, their problem was, quote, how to inhabit two worlds at the same time, the old world of their parents and the new world they encountered every day in city streets. The community and institutional studies, many of them unpublished student papers that formed the bedrock of the Chicago sociologist theories about all this can still be used today, as I mentioned earlier, to reconstruct the physical and social worlds of immigrants and also of their Americanizing children. If, as Michael Fisher suggests, ethnicity is an identity that is, quote, reinvented and interpreted in each generation, then certainly the second generation, rooted in the old but culturally immersed in the new, might tell us a great deal about how everyday sort of acculturation took place as a long-term process. Uh, think about it as something that occurs over a person's lifetime. As Su Shang Chan has noted for the Chinese American community in the era of exclusion, the second generation often acted as a powerful force in their own parents' acculturation. In other words, the changes are not just taking place among the children, it's the effect that they have on the older generation. They passed on the host language, of course, and elements of popular culture, acting as interpreters and as go-betweens. But they often reshaped cultural values as well through conflict with their elders. Given their position in this process, the second generation provides us a vantage point on the complex notion of personal and group identity and the diverse elements that comprise it. Surprisingly, the notion of generations, uh, uh, for immigration historians now I'm talking about, uh, has not received a great deal of attention. Uh, and for the students here, I would turn you back towards that problem. I think there's plenty of good work to be done. We assume that a mass culture built on Hollywood films, big band music, mass circulation magazines and tabloid newspapers gradually displaced these older ethnic cultures, especially among the second generation by the 1930s. And yet we know precious little of how this new culture, the mass culture, was absorbed and perhaps reshaped by the critical second generation in immigrant communities or about the generational tension such a process undoubtedly precipitated. The new mass market was a powerful solvent for the folkways of the past, Ellen Dolly suggests. Clearly, the pleasure domes of mass culture were a staging ground for revolt against the old world Catholic and Jewish patriarchy and a challenge to the dominant Yankee Protestant morality as well. But how we understand that process is what's still very much up in the air. And I want to um, give you sort of a graphic representation of this from the south side of Chicago. This is the struggle between the generations. And this is the struggle um, between the old country mothers uh, with babushkas uh, going down the street to market or whatever, uh, and the people who actually called themselves American girls. This was, the, this was the phrase that they would sort of embrace. And the great symbol for this, uh, to maybe bring us back to culture for a moment, was the fancy hat. The old country mothers were not only satisfied with, but sort of embraced the babushka as a symbol of their own for who they were. But the young American working girls saved their pennies and right away wanted a hat. And um, many of you will know this already, but these are family economies that we're talking about. And this expenditure on a frivolous thing like a fancy bonnet with a ribbon on it uh, causes sort of great tension within these families. And it's symbolic, but it's symbolic of something important, uh, which is the different sort of experiences and identity of these two generations. I won't go into it, would be glad to in discussion, but Vicky Ruiz shows that similar tensions rose between generations of women in Mexican immigrant communities. In many cities, a vibrant urban culture scene emerged between the wars, representing the roots of an American culture that was, in Albert Murray's famous words, incontestably mulatto. In Chicago, New York, and elsewhere, the new urban mass culture was produced and consumed largely by second generation European immigrant people together with migrants of color, 
during these years. The children of immigrants found their way in the new culture, David Nassau writes, effectively Americanizing themselves on the streets and in the city's amusement centers. Despite racial segregation, the persistence of ethnic subcultures and even the employment of new mass media in the service of foreign language cultures, despite all that, there was clearly a degree of mixing that took place in theaters, nightclubs, dance halls, and other urban venues. Chicago's Juvenile Protective League estimated, they actually go out to the dance halls and count people, they estimated that 86,000 of the city's youths went dancing nightly. Even in the ethnically segregated neighborhoods, they wrote, such as those in Chicago's Stockyard District, the jazz and jazz dancing popular in the downtown nightclubs and ballrooms had all but displaced the once popular Polish hop. Second generation Italian and Jewish Americans were particularly important in the crossover of black jazz forms from the African American community to the mainstream, for the moment, culture. Such musical hybridity became the daily cultural fare of many second generation ethnic workers. We know little about what such mixing represented in the lives of these young people and we are just beginning to appreciate what it meant for the character of American culture. I want to end with um, what seems to me the challenge here, which is, uh, you know, if we ask the reasonable question, so what do we do about this? Um, where does this leave us? I think the challenge is to reach from the global, I'm not suggesting that we don't think about immigration in global terms, but the real challenge is to reach from the global to the personal and still satisfy the old empirically inclined historians uh, like me who demand that we root all this change in real people's lives. In other words, to show what this actually meant for people in their, in their lives. I, I don't suggest that's an easy thing to do, but I think it's the way forward for studying immigration. When we try to integrate the history of all migrant peoples, not just these European people that I've spent the most time talking about. The problems with straight line models of assimilation become apparent. And yet, we need to go no further than our own campus community to see that, especially in the second generation, something like the kind of acculturation I've described here is relevant to the most recent installment of US immigration history. So to stick locally for the moment, in the face of both symbolic racism, in the form, for example, of the chief, and very real everyday racism, constructed identities like Latino, Latina, Native American, or Asian American, provide the basis for even broader identities, people of color. And they provide the basis as well for something I'm most interested in, which is new social movements based on these new broader identities. The new immigrant movement, too, often seen as a Mex sort of a Mexican identity movement, is at once a movement based on broader multi-ethnic immigrant identity. Uh, I spent a fascinating evening over dinner with, there were many people who organized the two big demonstrations in Chicago last spring, but the person that was probably more responsible than anybody else, he's a janitor at a school on the south side of Chicago. And he spoke very much about this, sort of consciously going about how to develop a broader sort of notion of, uh, of an immigrant sort of identity uh, that crosses these ethnic lines. And it's not only a matter of um, identity, the symbolism of this movement is important. So for example, American flags, as well as Mexican flags, bagpipes, as well as mariachi bands chants at these demonstrations in Cantonese and in Polish as well as in Spanish. And these are also, won't go into it, I'm ending at this point, but these are also working class movements, I would argue. They've taken the form of general strikes where they've been most effective and they've closed down industries in various places. The workers that take part in these demonstrations, if you bother to talk to them, will speak in class terms and so forth. So this is very much a working class movement as well. Those of us with interest in the history of immigration can at least take satisfaction in the recognition that a great deal is at stake here. The questions we consider about the class, racial, and gender identities of the new immigrants, about racial and ethnic conflict between migrants and settled populations, about the integration of immigrants into existing political and social movements and the creation of new ones, are the ones that we confront today. 
as the United States and other societies throughout the world become nations of immigrants. As in our engagement with migration issues in everyday life, the future of research in this area relies on considering the personal as well as the global dimensions and on an inter-ethnic and interracial sort of approach to the history of immigration. Thank you very much. All right, um, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to all of the people that uh, Jim had mentioned. I just want to say ditto to all of them. Uh, and thank you to all of you for uh, coming out here and braving the uh, cold uh, weather, stormy weather, uh, to be here with us. Um, I just want to say that uh, I happen to also be able to uh, read Professor Barrett, Jim, Jim's paper, uh, and I really uh, think I really enjoyed reading it as well as as hearing what he had to say today. And um, I guess one of the nice things about that is that he's kind of tackled a lot of different subjects uh, to make it easier for me uh, to just perhaps uh, you know look a little bit more closely at a few of the, uh, the topics that he's uh, mentioned or that he's discussed um, that have been the subject of such really interesting uh, immigration historical studies. Uh, the, I, I'm taking a couple of uh, important things, I believe, from, from uh, Jim's uh, paper. Uh, first of all, it's just something very basic, uh, is that uh, the subject of immigration and of migration in particular uh, is something that is very old uh, and that uh, it, it might seem like a very obvious fact, uh, but uh, if, you, if we read a lot of the discussions about immigration and about the debates on immigration, it would seem as though uh, immigration were something new that was happening, that we're in crisis. Uh, that we're facing these issues for the first time and maybe the only time in the history of the United States. Um, and so uh, Jim tells us where, uh, you know, how this literature has developed, especially in terms of the interrelationship that it has with uh, uh, the uh, historical uh, events regarding immigration, particularly the 1924 Immigration Act. Uh, that he addresses uh, in the what was then the new immigration. Um, and he's outlined, I think, um, the main themes uh, for us to really think through, uh, both for the study of immigration as well as perhaps to think in terms of the contemporary issues regarding uh, immigration. And those that I, uh, I saw particular word, the importance of inter-ethnic uh, relations and interactions, both in terms of relations and conflict. Uh, he's talked about the problem of generations and intergenerational change, uh, uh, the question of acculturation, uh, in particular that of Americanization, uh, whether it's coming from above or from below, um, as well as the, uh, the local and the global, and the, the importance of resituating immigration from the top down to the personal perspectives of migrants themselves, which I think is a very, very important intervention in terms of uh, migration as I look at it from today, because oftentimes uh, the, the view that we have of, of immigration is of a sort of a depersonalized uh, uh, you know, uh, entity. Um, the term that we have is for those who don't have documents is illegal aliens, you know. And so the, uh, uh, not only 
not legal, but also alien. <laughs> and so you know, how much farther can we move away from a sort of a humanization of what migrants um, are? Uh, so what I wanted to do was to at least pick up on a few themes. Uh, I'm not going to talk as eloquently or I don't have any seriously prepared comments about, uh, as uh, Jim has had, but I do want to touch on at least three uh, of these themes. One is, is the uh, question of the face of immigration today. Uh, that's one question. What is an immigrant today? What constitutes an immigrant uh, in a very, on a very basic sense? What is our image of, of an immigrant? Uh, the, second, the second theme is that of um, inter-ethnic and in intra-ethnic conflict. So we talk about inter-ethnic conflict, but uh, when we think about urban questions and about immigration, there's a lot of intra-ethnic conflict. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to speak to the uh, global transnational context, perhaps with an example, uh, particularly since very concerned with uh, Filipino migration. Um, now, when I mentioned to my students in my Immigrant America class, uh, and some of you have heard me say this, uh, you know, what comes to your mind when you think of the word immigrant? Right? And uh, very interestingly enough, uh, and I said, you know, positive views of immigrants. And their immediate response was Albert Einstein, Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Now, when I, when I asked them to think about, you know, immigration, right? immigration, um, and sort of this contrast of, uh, uh, between positive and negative, immediately, uh, and this is something that uh, Jim has touched on too, is that the, the image that we have is that of someone Mexican, a brown face, brown man, brown woman. And um, having been in California just uh, a month and a half or so and reading the papers, uh, that image continues to grow and enlarge every day uh, with articles you know, uh, on illegal immigration. Uh, the image is sort of all condensed in the minds, or becoming condensed in the minds of people about how illegal immigrants are crossing uh, from this underdeveloped Mexican economy, what some call the failed Mexican state, uh, to jobs in American industry, agriculture, or American households, taking away jobs from ordinary Americans. They are pictured as invading America, jumping over fences, swimming through rivers, crossing deserts, setting up shanty towns, uh, refusing to pay taxes, sucking up the welfare system ed and educational resources for uh, their children, taking out driver's licenses, you name it, uh, and eating away literally and metaphorically at the very woodwork of the American home. Um, now, we don't get very often, the other side of that, you would have to read sort of the editorials, the LA Times and some other things to realize that undocumented immigrants, as much as legal immigrants, contribute a great deal to uh, American society. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have seen a spoof like A Day Without a Mexican. All right, uh, very true, especially for California, but for many, many places in the country today, which, you know, you, if you see the movie, you understand the impossibility of life, of normal life in the United States today without undocumented labor. Uh, as a, an editor from The Nation reported, he says, we have a, an attitude towards undocumented people that we can't live with them, we can't live without them, right? We would rather be rid of them, but then on the other hand, you think about all of the folk who are going to pick the fruits and vegetables that we eat on our table every day, who's going to cook and who has cooked and prepared the foods behind the counter, uh, who, who packs the meats, who sews the garments, 
both on this side of the border and in the maquiladoras on the other side, uh, who, who will take care of the children, who will take care of the parents, the, our aging parents. Uh, in large part, they are here because we need them. And we create the demand for this kind of labor. Uh, and we can't see a normal existence, a normal middle class existence without this kind of support. Uh, and a lot of corporations cannot see being competitive in the world without the labor of the undocumented. Right? Uh, but I think it's, it's very important to look at this uh, uh, you know, this image and how important it is, uh, the, uh, how pervasive this particular image remains, you know, of, uh, of Mexican-Americans, uh, the, the difference between this dehumanizing narrative of aliens, illegals, uh, parasites, uh, and the actual reality of what they do. Uh, because in the dehumanization of them, this is the prelude to the war the rhetoric of war. Uh, whereas if we look at the relationships uh, of labor, of caring, and so forth, we come up with a different picture of what immigration or what kind of policies there should be uh, towards uh, immigrants. But I think that uh, on a larger basis, uh, you know, um, immigration affects us a lot more even than this, the particular question of, of uh, being documented or undocumented. Uh, as I said, uh, my students, uh, you know, see at least that, you know, certain people in our society are, that have made important contributions uh, were immigrants or are immigrants. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, op-ed piece in the LA Times that I read recently uh, about, it's a very subtle uh, endorsement for changing, the, doing a constitutional amendment to allow for a president uh, to, of the United States to be an immigrant, right? So, uh, but this editorial also mentioned some very interesting names of people who are immigrants uh, and uh, have made some very important contributions to the society. Uh, Maybe we could just say, does anybody know who Andy Grobe is? Right? He's one of the founders of Intel, uh, who is, uh, along with uh, Gates, Bill Gates is one of the two most responsible people for the computer revolution. Andy Grobe uh, was a, a, an immigrant from Hungary. Right? Uh, Jerry Yang. Uh, of Yahoo was, a, it was from or is from Taiwan. Uh, Peter Jennings and Robert McNeil, uh, two important uh, journalists. Uh, Peter Jennings, obviously from Canada, uh, and Robert McNeil, uh, I believe, is British. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that they also struggled or grappled with the question of, of citizenship, right? Uh, but in some ways, we don't even think of some of these people as being immigrants. Uh, and you could extend that to some other places such as uh, you know, black migrants from, uh, from the Caribbean, uh, Patrick Ewing you know, uh, or Tim Duncan, who are not, uh, uh, often not seen or discussed as immigrants in, this, in our society. Right? Uh, and so uh, I think immigration uh, even beyond the, the question of undocumented migration is a much more pervasive aspect of our society and immigrants have made contributions uh, in a far in a far wider basis than uh, we're willing to allow uh, now the second point that I wanted to to address is that question of of interracial conflict and, and spe specifically interracial conflict. Um, I think we need to be more cognizant and come to terms with the idea of conflict in general um, and neither become too, uh, to, to exaggerate conflict or, or to minimize conflict. 
Uh, for instance, uh, the, the example I'd just like to say, just for uh, lack of time, is that uh, there are some very, very uh, crucial events that are happening uh, in particularly in urban communities that show the uh, complexities of immigration today. Uh, if we are to talk about interracial conflict simply in terms of whiteness, for instance, I think whiteness studies is very, very important. Uh, but how do we explain the kinds of black-brown conflict that are existing in the uh, communities? Um, Today. There was in the, um, uh, the, the Los Angeles Times, uh, the last couple of weeks have been full of reports of black-brown conflict, particularly in the, um, in the Los Angeles area of Long Beach, right? uh, where the other weekend um, uh, there was, uh, there were, uh, there was a, an African-American father who was sitting in uh, or standing in the corner waiting for his daughter to come out of school and is gunned down by a Latino gang, right? Um, and uh, normally this would be reduced to a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a gang-related incident, except for the fact that the father, African-American male, had nothing to do with gang violence. He was simply standing on the corner of this intersection. Right, uh, and one of the things that is happening is that uh, because of uh, different kinds of shifts in employment and so forth, now more African Americans are going into an area that had been predominantly Latino, right? So uh, in much the same way, perhaps, that during a certain time period, Latinos begin to be coming into a particular area in South Los Angeles that had been largely considered as black. Right. Um, how do we account for the, uh, well, in this particular case as well, there was a great deal of animosity displayed towards African uh, Americans. Um, more recently, there's also a question of how do we explain for black on white violence? Uh, recently, there were eight uh, uh, black teenagers, teenage women who were convicted in Long Beach also of, uh, of attacking three white women during a Holly, Halloween uh, uh, party and uh, for also uttering racial epithets right, towards these white women. Uh, how do we address this question right, in terms of uh, African Americans and the race, racism that that uh, that seems to uh, you know seems to uh, exemplify, um, and so there are these all of these different uh, questions about interracial as well as intra-racial conflict that I think are very important that are not fully uh, encompassed by uh, perhaps an immigrant immigration paradigm. Uh, that deals with conflict, but only in terms of white, black, or white, Latino, or white, Asian, but, but in terms of the relationships between uh, people of color who are becoming large numbers and majorities in these uh, particular settings. Uh, and finally, let me just uh, speak to the question of the transnationalism, um, because uh, the uh, there are an increasing number of, uh, well, for, if we speak about immigration in terms of a paradigm of, a linear paradigm of, um, you know, separation from the old country and migration into the United States to become citizens and to uh, become assimilated. Uh, and, and, you know, Jim has also talked about this in his paper in terms of, we miss the whole multi-directionality of migration, uh, in, in the way in which uh, uh, you know, immigration, the process of movement is not just one way, but in fact, there's reverse migration. People go back for very, very different reasons uh, and uh, sometimes come into the United States indirectly, right? 
Um, and uh, in my experience in particular, uh, in relation to uh, Filipino migrants, this has become a much more and more uh, pervasive development, right? especially in the wake of uh, the uh, overthrow of the Marcos dicta dictatorship in 1986. Now you have uh, the proliferation of the opposite migration. Right? Uh, a lot of Filipino Americans, second generation, who uh, are going back to the Philippines for various, various things. Uh, I have friends who have gone back to the Philippines now to join the Philippine basketball teams as a way to get themselves prepared and hopefully be able to enter the NBA, right? Uh, because the, the NBA actually is now also very transnational and looks out into all of these different countries, right? There are uh, Filipino Americans, U.S. born Filipino Americans, second and third generation going back to the Philippines uh, to become successful entertainers. Right? Uh, there are uh, medical missions that go out into uh, you know, areas that have been ravaged by like the more recent mudslides as well as the storms, uh, earthquakes, and so forth. Um, and finally, there's uh, a tremendous amount of interest uh, in politics. Right, in, in, in the elections that are going on in, um, in the Philippines itself. Well, the last presidential elections in 2004, there were uh, people here that were canvassing for votes as well as for uh, uh, funds. Uh, more recently, uh, with the congressional elections coming up, there are a lot of people that are, are doing the same things again. Um, and, and I think you could see, if, if you sort of followed the, the recent Mexican presidential election, some of the same parallels uh, to this. Uh, a lot of, uh, it was interesting in, in Los Angeles is that there, there the Spanish language stations, well, in other states as well, the Spanish language stations that are broadcasting from Mexico to uh, you know, Southwest communities here in Spanish, but talking about um, are trying to canvass uh, votes, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, for the presidential elections. Um, and so those are just some of the things that, um, that I wanted to, to at least bring up or, you know, raise as questions for, for us to think about. Examples, some contemporary examples uh, from what, uh, you know, Jim Barrett had, had talked about in terms of his presentation. Um, and if we have time, if we could get into discussion of this, I, I think it would be really interesting to also pursue the kinds of uh, solutions or kind of approaches to immigration uh, that uh, he had mentioned. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there are several questions, we might take like three and let them react to them. Are there, do you have questions? There, I know they spoke clearly and, yes. Why, oh, we need you to come to the microphone because it is being taped. I just remembered that. Very low microphone. <laughs> Very interesting presentation, by the way, from you both, and that was uh, very, very good. I'd just like to kind of put out a proposition, and Jim, I was uh, very interested in your uh, uh, mentioning the globalization of immigration and the fact that many uh, European groups migrated to Latin America. And uh, uh, it seems that, um, and I just wonder if somebody's looking at this, that uh, say using the measure of, of uh, qualifying for uh, presidency of a major of a, of a major party and uh, going being elected president. 
we, we've had uh, presidents in Latin American countries, I think of Kubitschek in Brazil, uh, Fijimori in forget what country he was in, but you've had uh, many right. Latin American, you know, heads of government uh, elected and otherwise uh, with uh, European sounding, you know, non-Hispanic non, non names. And it took us till 1960 for an Irish American and Catholic to be elected president of this country. And I was just trying to count, you know, if you use the measure of uh, being nominated by a major party for president or vice president. We've only had three, since 1960, we've only had three Catholics. Um, I believe William Miller, uh, Geraldine per per uh, Perrero, and uh, uh, Kerry. Uh, and, and then Spiro Agnew and Michael Dukakis as Greek Americans. But with those exceptions, you know, everybody else has been you know, Native uh, American Protestants, I believe. Uh, whereas uh, it seems in Latin America there has been, again, using this measure of, uh, say, candidacy or, or being elected president of, uh, of, of a nation as, as your measure, that there, there has been more upward mobility of those, of, of those, uh, of those immigrant, European immigrant groups uh, than there possibly has, has, has been here. So I don't know if you have any reaction to that. This will be in shorthand. <laughs> um, one distinction to make, I think, is that um, somebody here can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but even in Latin America, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're talking about at least second generation people. So, so even in that case, I mean, before we move to the United States, uh, uh, you may be talking about people from immigrant backgrounds like Fujimori, Fujimori in Peru. Um, you know, there have been people in Argentina and Brazil and other places. Um, but the, there is a distinction to be made, uh, which is that um, it looks like in the second generation, in many of these countries, that can happen. And it looks like in the second generation, that's not at all likely in the United States. And this is very predictable coming from me, but one thing that I would like to suggest, I'm, I'm happy to uh, acknowledge that um, you can get uh, discrimination built into the political system along lines like you, you mentioned uh, religion a couple of times or, you know, nationality. Um, I'm pretty sure that class has something to do with this. In other words, it's, uh, it's probably not a coincidence that people from more recent sort of immigrant backgrounds, even if they were born here in the United States, haven't come up to that sort of, they, they have come up to other positions, but I mean, not, not quite that far in the uh, in the electoral sort of system. So there's still a distinction to be made, but I, I would guess that even in Latin American countries, it's not so easy. Uh, it, it might be impossible. Maybe just one more idea that came from a lecture that Doug um, Kibbe gave a couple weeks ago. And that has to do with um, uh, not just formal citizenship, which differs a lot from one society to another. In other words, how, how do you kind of become a naturalized citizen and when are you recognized? Um, but also to go along with it, what Augusto was talking about, who is an immigrant, you know, what, what's the face of an immigrant and how do we recognize an immigrant and how do we define it popularly? So what's the face of a citizen? And, uh, you know, who's a real American, quote unquote, and in that regard, who, who can get elected to different, I, I think we're going to find out uh, pretty soon. But, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think that that has been a problem uh, for, for us here. I think you may need to get up here. Yeah, I think just real quick, the, uh, the problems in terms of, Latin, from what I know, in terms of Latin America, largely centered on race and on class, uh, less so on, well, I'm sure there probably is also a question of immigration there, but it, this last four or five years is the first time I think that Venezuela, for instance, elected someone who is, of dark skin, uh, and who's uh, uh, from the, one of the poor segments of the population. I mean, the same with Bolivia, Evo Morales is indigenous. Uh, and uh, one of the articles I read is, uh, is uh, race is also, and class are also responsible for why uh, Lopez Obrador was not able to succeed in Mexico, because he's much darker skinned and speaks to these different issues of the poor. Uh, so, uh, but I think your question is, is, is intriguing <laughs> in terms of uh, is there, uh, you know, this kind of uh, 
way in which is there there's so, more social mobility for uh, immigrants in Latin America. Perhaps it seems that way, but but maybe there's really more of a continuity, right, in terms of how they see uh, you know what is acceptable because they also are Americans, right? What is an acceptable uh, you know South American acceptable uh, Latin American um, and what's not. Uh, hello. Um, I really enjoy your, your presentation, Jim, and also your comments, Augusto. Uh, always profound, Augusto, and uh, right to the point. And I, I love the scope of your paper. Uh, and it's really hard to deal with so many levels, uh, global, uh, local, personal. And, but then also the different historical moments that you tried to capture, Jim. I really appreciated that. So I would like to read the paper at some point. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, with regard to Latin America, you know, there's the colonial legacy there, which is a very different uh, context than for the U.S. Depends on how we talk about race relations in the Americas. So very different histories, multiple histories. I think it would go uh, along with what I think what you were trying to to say about at least regarding the U.S. about the many uh, Amer Amer uh, Americanisms, which I like that concept, but I'm not sure that that concept. Uh, as you presented it, kind of, uh, uh, I think the concept itself was richer for me than the idea of uh, Americanization. So I had a problem with the Americanization narrative, and I think there's much more there to, to explore, uh, analytically, perhaps. But I, I get your point, and I really liked it. Um, uh, my, I just have a question. Uh, it has to do more with, uh, with you guys as historians, you know? I am an ethnographer, as you know, an anthropologist. But I, uh, I've been following this sort of reaction to immigration or immigration issues or events on the part of African Americans. And I just wonder, what would you say as historians? You know, I, I, didn't, I would like to know more about how were African Americans reacting to the different immigrants, uh, even in, during the historical period that you are covering. Um, because today, it is, there's, that's a very important issue. Uh, that in itself, I just would like to know what you think, because obviously their own experiences in the USA has to do with slavery. And um, I just would like to get a sense of what, uh, what you think, you know, what you think, it's, again, specifically how African Americans have reacted to immigration Throughout the 20th century, if, you don't, you know, if I can ask you that mm -hmm. question, I'm very curious because it's something that I believe that all of us who study or specialize uh, within different uh, ethnic communities, that we need to address that question as to how blacks and African, you know, African Americans are, are thinking about this issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the question is so good that the answer is very short. We don't know. Um, in other words, I can uh, think of a few studies, and I can suggest ways that one might do this, but it's, unless my, my uh, young colleague here will correct me, uh, with a few exceptions, there's not very much uh, on this. There's a really interesting study that uh, one of my students did here on race in mining towns in Illinois. And uh, I, I'll be very brief, but it gives an example of how rich this might be, the question that you're asking. Um, there was a race riot that occurred, uh, it was in the wake of a strike in 1894, and the race riot occurred in 1895, and the black miners and their families were driven out of this town by a mixed, ethnically mixed group, but, but largely Italian um, group of miners. And these Italian miners were put on trial then for a certain amount of violence, and, uh, you know, rightly, uh, and a number of them went to, went to prison. But what was really interesting about the trial when she looked at the uh, transcripts was the deployment of what you would have to call nativist kind of language on the part of African American miners and their families. In other words, what was bad about the situation was not simply that innocent people were hurt and driven from their community, I'm talking about the black miners and their families, but that this was done by these foreigners we're Americans, 
you know, we were born in this country and we helped to build this country. And they, they even allude to the legacy of slavery and we've overcome that and we're working our way up. And uh, these foreigners come in here and, uh, um, you know, not only are they taking jobs and lowering conditions and so forth, but now they won't even allow us to, to work where we need to work and to live in these communities. And this is a very, this last remark I'm going to make is a very dangerous sort of remark maybe to make, but just to get people thinking a little bit, Augusto drew our attention to uh, conflict um, among people of color, in other words, within the community of people of color. And I would suggest that this language that I just referred to is not completely unknown uh, in the last eight or 10 years. Uh, uh, it, it's not common as far as I can see. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm referring to a certain amount of antagonism towards immigrants within the uh, African American community, also within the white community, of course, but, uh, but, it, but the, the former is not unknown. And um, the ways to do this for anybody here that gets interested, and I, I, again, I would argue this is wide open. This is a real good topic, and I think it can be worked on. And there's a little bit of work on African-American newspapers, in other words, going back to see what the editorial line is and so forth. But I think the story is actually much richer than that. Social historians reconstruct people's attitudes and, and consciousness from behavior, for example, uh, you know, riots and, and uh, uh, informal behavior and so forth. And I think there's that kind of work to be done. There are some sources to use. So you might have more to say about that. But. Uh, maybe to just explain. To expand on, uh, oh, okay, and Jim's comments, so I'm doubly wired now. Um, I, I think that uh, definitely the, the history of nativism in African American community is uh, something that there's been some literature uh, that's been done. I don't think it's been that much, uh, especially in the contemporary period. There's there's definitely a lot. There are a lot of issues, a lot of questions uh, uh, that need to be dealt with. Uh, I if, even like even such a thing as like the uh, the L.A. riots uh, of the the, the of ni early 1990s. Right, you have all of these really really complex issues um, of deindustrialization, of police brutality, and and all of these things that are condensed in a so-called black Korean conflict, right? Uh, and so there are other things besides nativism, even though nativism is, is definitely one of them, but there's also, you have to look at, like uh, as was he was saying, uh, Jim was saying in context, that there's also this sort of way in which Koreans, Im Korean immigrants were socialized to be nativist or racist in a certain way, you know, uh, of, of the, the, what is the prevailing image that many of them uh, receive of American, uh, American blacks from Korea, what's being exported, you know, out there. This, this became an issue with, with, uh, with uh, Vicente Fox uh, last year, you know, what he was saying about, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Mexicans will do whatever jobs. Even, the, even African Americans will. I mean, it's all of these, these kinds of issues. Of what's being projected? Um, but the other thing, I guess, I just wanted to say, just real quick, is that the history of migration is not the only context in which you could you could examine this question, because it's also uh, the history of black nationalism is also very important in that as a kind of. Uh, intersection with it because there's within black nationalism I think you know a lot of uh, people have been increasingly exploring this is that the, the influence of Asian nationalisms on black nationalism the influence of Japan uh, at the turn of the century as an industrializing modernizing power and, and oops and the Excuse me, and the uh, the impact that that had on African American nationalisms from Du Bois to some other people, uh, you know, as well as uh, uh, you know uh, Mao Zedong, you know, during the uh, the '60s uh, radical movement. So there's there's all of these and kung fu and all of these all of these uh, ways in which there's a connection between Asian and African American. Uh, also, you know, I think that that really needs to be. Uh, explored as well. <laughs>
just like to make one brief comment myself, and that is that uh, in regard to the idea that immigration is a linear concept, we drove our uh, graphic artists, I think, crazy telling them that we did not want a linear <laughs> logo for this, that we want arrows showing migration from different places in different directions and curved and, and still look decent. Uh, and so he did a pretty good job of coming up with that. But I. For us, immigration, one reason we chose it is because it's used a lot in the media and because it's very policy oriented. But I think it is important to think about the difference in back and forth flows and reverse migration into different parts of the world. And I would just like to raise why the question you raised about who were the immigrants, uh, although you showed some Jim especially had some slides and that included women as well as men. Women are about half the immigrants these days. And, and who are they? You know, Madeleine Albright and who else? <laughs> I mean, it's, so uh, there's a lot of different aspects to look at of these stories. I think the speakers did a great job and I'd like to thank them and wind up for today. Thank you. Thank you.